This happened to me three years ago. I was in college, but I took night classes because I was working full time in the daytime. That night, my class ended at around 10 p.m. The school is a bit far away from my house. I could walk, but it was winter and lots of snow had fallen that week. The walkways were full of snow. It would have taken me forever to walk home. My bus app told me I had just missed the bus and the next one was 30 minutes away. When this happens, I would always walk to the nearest subway because there was another bus stop and instead of waiting and freezing, I would walk to warm myself up a little bit. So that is exactly what I did that night. The shortest way to the subway station was through a park. I always took the path and I had no reason to worry that this night was going to be any different. Before arriving to the park entrance, I noticed there was a guy with a very recognizable hockey themed winter hat smoking near the benches. As soon as he saw me, he picked up his things and slowly walked toward the walkway. I have no idea why, but I found him suspicious and I remembered something my mom told me when I was a kid. When you feel something is off about someone at night, find any reason you can to slow down and let him walk past you. You'd rather have someone in front of you than behind. For some reason, I thought he was weird and did just like my mom told me. I faked receiving a text message and slowed down so he would be in front of me. He was so incredibly slow as if he wanted me to get past him, but I would just slow down even more. He was vaping something that smelled like super fake strawberry. This will be important later. I was hoping he wouldn't go into the park, but he did. We walk like that in the park until I noticed there was a hockey game going on. I decided I would go and watch the match just to let him take some distance before I would keep going. As I was turning right to get to the outdoor ice rink, he turned left on a path that goes by a building. I was reassured that he wasn't going in the same direction I needed to go. Still, I was a bit curious about the match, so I watched it for a minute or so and then turned back to go on my path. As I turned, my blood ran cold. The same guy that turned left was turning the other corner of the building. He just walked around the building. If I'd kept going instead of watching the hockey, by doing this, he would have been behind me. I was petrified, but I was still relatively safe because there were people around me. The guy walked slowly as ever in the direction I needed to go, but I did not follow him straight away. I waited for a bunch of students to walk by and walked behind them. Safety in numbers, I guess. He was waiting by the park exit, checking his phone. When he saw the bunch of students and I, he walked away. Normal speed this time. I saw him turn right on his street, and I thought that was the end of it. Eventually, I reached the subway station and started waiting for the bus. And then, I smelled a very familiar potent strawberry smell. As I turned to look around, there was the guy with the hockey themed hat and another guy, both staring at me. When the bus arrived, I was shaking and it was not because of the cold. And they both got on the bus with me and other passengers. I told the bus driver about what happened. Where I live, past 9pm, women can ask a bus driver to be dropped off alone at a bus stop, making sure that nobody can follow her. And that is exactly what the bus driver did. I had the bright idea to get out on one stop earlier and I walked in the opposite direction from my home and waited for the bus to leave. I turned around to wave at the bus driver as a way of thanking him and I saw the two guys banging on the middle door. The bus driver locked them so they wouldn't open it. I took the bus almost every night and I never saw those two guys nor have I ever seen them around my house, but here they were banging on the door and although I could not hear them, I could clearly see them yell at the bus driver. When the lights finally turned green, 
and the bus left. I rushed back home, faster than I ever did in the snow. The next night after school, I was too nervous to use my shortcut through the park, so I took the long way around, and I got to my bus safely. But what I saw on that ride scared the living hell out of me. At the bus stop that I had been dropped off at the previous day, there were two guys. One with a hockey-themed hat. They did not get on the bus. My first thought was that they were waiting for me, and not the bus. Lucky for me, this was not my stop. Maybe I was paranoid, and all of this was just a strange series of coincidences, but I was scared to get on that bus, and I still am today. I moved in with my boyfriend since then, but the shortest way to our house is through the park, and I still take the long way around at night. Back in my freshman year of college, I was a fairly trusting person and probably got myself into a lot of bad situations. I was pretty dumb and very lucky. However, there was one incident that will always remind me to have better situational awareness. I was walking back to my dorm from a class in the early evening, speed walking because I had another class at night and wanted time to relax beforehand. I had my earbuds in, listening to music, and I passed a very tall, broadly built guy on the sidewalk as I was coming up to my dorm. I only took notice of him for a second because he was walking rather slowly and taking up the middle of the sidewalk. Now I had to step off into the grass to get around him, but I don't think I did this very rudely. I probably would have forgotten him entirely if the following events didn't occur. I crossed the street and walked up to my hall's entrance and swiped my key. They warn us not to allow others to tailgate because people unauthorized into the building can get in. No one followed this rule and I didn't want to ever be rude and close the door on someone right behind me. That's when I noticed the guy I had passed earlier was close enough for me to let him grab the door and let himself in, which I allowed, thinking again nothing of it because it's something I always did. I lived on the fifth floor, which was a girl's only floor. The genders were separated by floors. So floor four and floor six would be the men's floors nearest to mine. He and I got on the elevator with a few other people. I pressed the button for the fifth floor and noticed he didn't press any numbers. But that's fine. Maybe he was getting off on the floors before me, like the others in the elevator. We stop at the second floor and a couple leave and he doesn't get off. We stop again at the fourth floor and the remaining person leaves. He stays. And now we're alone. This is when I started to feel a bit funny. He wasn't standing too close or anything, but he seemed to be looking anywhere but at me as we rode up to the fifth floor. I did think it was odd, but it could be explained by mere coincidence. Anyway, we stop on my floor and I leave first relieved to leave the awkward space and continue on my way. Now, my hall was a Y-shaped building. Upon leaving the elevator, you either went left or right down two separate wings. I turned left, as my dorm is about in the center of the left wing. That's when I noticed he was following behind me, and even when I picked up my pace, he kept up with me. Being taller, he wasn't exactly hurrying, but this is what really pushed my paranoia. It really felt he wasn't walking on his own, with a destination in mind of course, and he could easily pass me if he wanted to, but no, he maintained a steady distance from me. I was being followed. I started to panic and when I reached my door, I realized how empty my floor was at this time of day. He was going to reach me just as I opened my door, and that's when I decided it would be better to stay in a public space and scream if I needed assistance. 
I could also run further down the hall and down the stairs at the end of the wing. If I opened my dorm room, it would be too easy for him to come in, lock the door, and overpower me. I always kept my keys in my pocket, but as he approached, I instead swung my backpack off of my back so I could leave it if I needed to run, and fumbled around inside it as if I was searching for my keys. Now, I don't know why I was trying to act so cool, as if I wasn't scared and that I wasn't opening my door because I was terrified of him, then what was I? Especially since, maybe, he might pass me and actually be visiting someone further down the hall, and wouldn't I look silly then? That's when he stopped just two yards away from me, past all the other doors, stopping at mine. He stood there for a moment, and I ignored him, hand fumbling uselessly around the inside of my backpack. I did not look up, and then he turned, walked back down the way he came from, and I heard the elevator door open. Feeling safe to open my dorm room without fear he might come charging back down the hallway, I hurriedly got inside and locked the door. I immediately called my mother just in case, needing to feel not totally alone since my roommate was not home. Later, I calmed down and waited until my roommate returned. I skipped my next class because I didn't want to walk in the dark. Initially, I had felt good about my quick thinking, but then I realized one really bad detail, important by the way. I should have kept walking. I shouldn't have stopped at my door, because now he knew which dorm was mine. Now I haven't seen him since, but stranger who followed me back to my dorm when I was a freshman girl. Let's not meet. Hey everyone, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. If you haven't already done so, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it so you can be notified of any and all future scary stories narration videos coming here to the Creepy Fox YouTube channel. I'm sure you're going to enjoy your stay. Now, let's continue on with these scary stories. I was living on my own for the first time in a new apartment in a town known for drug abuse, homelessness, and cows. My apartment was on a decent side of town, far enough from the cows at least. However, there was a high turnover rate in the neighboring apartments, so I rarely knew who lived nearby, and I preferred it that way. After a few issues, such as someone hiding in my bushes and another person breaking a window, I decided to be more personable to the immediate neighbors in case I ever faced a problem that my pepper spray and investigation discovery training couldn't solve. My upstairs neighbors were both young college guys, a terrifying enough prospect for a grad student who teaches undergrads. What if they were my students? But my nearest neighbor was a man in his late thirties slash early forties. We shared a wall, an entryway, and our doors faced each other. I met him soon after he moved in, while he was coming back from work in his painter's overalls, and he was nothing but nice. I felt fortunate that someone was perhaps a little more capable than myself moved in, but that feeling did not last. I first noticed the phone propped in my entryway window facing the parking lot the next day. It wasn't always there, of course, but it sat leaned up on the glass more often than not. It wasn't charging. I glanced for a cord, and it always appeared to be on. I next noticed the yelling. Every few nights, my neighbor would suddenly start yelling at crackheads around their property. Now, I'm not saying that there were no crackheads around. The cows are probably on crack around here as well, but I never saw anyone. He would storm through his door either to his back patio or into the parking lot, hollering at the top of his voice. He once tried to intimidate a group of students just coming home in the parking lot apparently because they had bags of crack with them. It was around this time his car stopped leaving the complex. He was always home. 
We both had alarms in our apartments to deter burglars, so each time I opened my door, it would chime, and each time he opened his door, it would chime. I started to suspect he was paying close attention to when I would come and go, as he would sometimes open his door shortly after I left, or close it abruptly if I was coming home. Our night manager also confirmed that my neighbor had tried to offer the videos he was taking using his phone in the window for security purposes. Each time I would come or go, I was on camera. There was one night during this period that I realized how paranoid this neighbor was making me. I was coming home after it was already dark, about 8pm, not too late, and saw his apartment was wrong. He only had his bedroom light on, but the light wasn't yellow or white. It was red, like he'd taken out his normal light bulb and swapped it in for a cheap colored light from the Halloween superstore. Now, although I'm a generally rational person, I couldn't help but think, Welp, that's definitely mood lighting for a murder. I sat in the car for the next 30 minutes, but eventually made my way inside. Nothing else happened. That night, the final straw, before I found a new place to temporarily stay, happened on a day I accidentally ran into him in our entryway. We had a perfectly pleasant conversation where my ingrained politeness overcame my sense that this guy could hurt you, he is not well. Later that same day, I finished cooking and putting away dinner and decided to take out the trash. When I left with the trash, his door was closed. When I came back, his door was open. I glanced at his door to see if he was there. All but one of his lights were off so all I could see was his silhouette peeking around the corner of his hallway. I very, very quickly let myself into my apartment and looked through the eye hole on the door. The man walked from the shadows of his hallway, naked from the waist down, and was pleasuring himself at his front door. He wasn't there long before he shut the door, but I was done. This has been the culmination of months of screaming at crackheads, obsessively videotaping neighbors, strange lighting choices, and now this? Done. The next morning, my friends helped me take a few things to a new place I could stay at. I found out from the night manager that the man was being evicted for stalking and harassing others in the complex, as well as after numerous noise complaints. I didn't return to my place until after he was gone, but I still felt as if he could pop out from any corner. I recently moved to a new apartment, and I thanked my night manager for keeping me informed of everything. She laughed and said, Wouldn't it be crazy if he was your neighbor at the new place? No. No thank you. Neighbor, let's not meet again. A few years ago, during what was probably the darkest period in my life, I worked overnights at a local Walmart. Six days a week, I would spend 9pm to 7am stocking anything from fishing lures to makeup. I've never been in a more depressing environment. Everyone was really apathetic and too caught up in their own depressing lives to care about anything or anyone else. This included the managers. Now, Walmarts have a generally weird vibe to them anyway, but this was a 24-hour supercenter in rural West Virginia, so you can imagine the characters, meth and opioid addicts, mostly, and they would show up throughout the night. We had no security guards, and from what I have come to understand, a lot of the cameras, especially in the parking lot, haven't worked properly in a while. Being one of the few young female overnight stalkers, I encountered my fair share of unwanted advances, but the one who took the cake was the guy who would show up every time I went outside for a smoke break, regardless of the time. 2am, 4am, 6am, it didn't matter. Dude would appear around the corner to try and strike up a conversation within seconds of me stepping outside. It didn't matter what entrance I used, and there was three. At first I assumed he worked there, 
Why else would anyone voluntarily lurk around a terrible Walmart at all hours of the night? Pretty much everyone on that shift smoked during their two nightly 15 minute breaks, so it wasn't out of the question to think he was doing the same. Maybe the timing was just a coincidence. But no, I came to find out he didn't work there, even though he often wore a dark blue t-shirt, just like an overnight employee. I stopped going outside alone, and would only venture outside with one of my guy friends, particularly one I'd been friends with since middle school. Even their presence alone didn't deter him, and it kind of became a store-wide joke. I was weirded out, but not alarmed until he started getting a little more aggressive. He'd ask me if I was seeing anyone, and would ask me out, pretty much every chance he got. I was playing GTA 5 at the time, so I came up with a story about my scary long-distance boyfriend Trevor from Northern California. Even then, he wasn't phased. I was done feigning politeness and began ignoring him. One night, when my main guy friend had called in sick, and the others were working on something on the opposite side of the store, I went outside with two older women in my area. After a few minutes, they went inside, and just as I was about to follow them, Walmart Creeper suddenly appeared, pretty sure he'd been waiting around the corner, and insisted on me going to his car with him to see something, taking my hand in his. Not hard, but I was still pissed he touched me. I'm a generally angry person anyway, so I lost my stuff, ripped my hand away, and sprinted inside. I reported him to the head manager that night, and found out he had a cousin who worked in the back unloading trucks, Apparently, he liked to hang out with his cousin at work. The cousin apologized profusely and said he'd talk to him, but the management was a whole other level of terribleness and didn't even say anything to the creeper, let alone ban him from the premises. I ended up quitting specifically because of that horrible management, although it was over an entirely different situation. I found out through a friend that the guy who was still hanging out at the store every night and was still doing his creepy thing with other women, tried like hell to learn my name and where I lived. He was apparently asking around about me for weeks after I left, before disappearing himself. I can't help but keep thinking about how those parking lot cameras haven't worked in such a long time, and if anyone would have cared enough to notice if I just disappeared on one of those long, tiring work nights. Hey everyone, I thought now that my weird and creepy neighbor moved out two weeks ago, I can finally talk about it, and I'll give some background first. I moved into my apartment pretty quick to escape a bad roommate situation. I didn't get to do my normal checks on the area, but I figured it would be okay because I was relatively familiar with the area. I live in a quadplex and have a bottom one bedroom apartment. I thought that everything should be fine because I had seen what I thought was all the other tenants when I went to look at the apartment. I had not seen everyone, however. My direct upstairs neighbor was a greasy, white man that was beer belly fat. He was in his mid-sixties and gave me a really bad gut feeling. When I moved, I also worked kind of odd hours and would be getting home between 10pm to 2am depending on which job I was working. I'm a fairly quiet person as well. I occasionally listen to music on a speaker, but it's always at a moderate volume, and during the daytime. I came home one night around 11pm, and I'd entered my house and was trying to make some leftovers for dinner and watching a video on my phone, when my direct upstairs neighbor, we'll call him Kevin, came downstairs and was banging on my door, and repeatedly ringing my doorbell. He was making like a thousand times more noise than I had been collectively over the month I had been there. I answered the door, and he was mad, saying I need to stop banging around, quiet hours were at 10pm, and I'm being inconsiderate, etc, etc. I was not making any noise outside of normal living noises. The banging was me shutting my car door once, this set the tone for our relationship going forward. He would get pissed at me coming home from work 
and closing my door because it would wake him up. I tried to explain I don't control my work schedule, and he could also try not to sleep with every single window open in his apartment, and then maybe the noise wouldn't be loud or noticeable. He hated that. Another few months go by and Kevin comes down to my apartment holding two margaritas and tries to be all like, I'm sorry we started off on the wrong foot, let's make amends, etc, etc, but was being kind of weird and seemed like he was trying way too hard to hide his excitement or something. I agree and said that if he has a problem we can discuss it like normal adults and vice versa. He was a little too eager to agree and tried to give me the second margarita. I declined because I was underage and I don't accept drinks from strangers. He insisted and practically shoved the margarita in my hand. I felt super uneasy and reluctantly accepted. He almost demanded that I drink it as a toast to our newfound civility. I pretended to take a sip, but I ended the conversation and closed and locked my door. I dumped the margarita and felt really grossed out by the whole situation. Now, with all of that said, I am fairly certain he attempted to drug me and I don't even want to think about what he would have done if I drank that margarita. I'm so glad that he moved out. So creepy neighbor Kevin, let's not meet again. This isn't as scary as some of the other stories in this sub, but it was definitely one of the strangest experiences of my college career. I lived on the top floor, fourth floor, of my dorm sophomore year. I had a great roommate and was surrounded by friends on the floor. Since we were on the top floor, no one really came up unless they lived there and the fourth floor community was so nice, we never really gave mind to keeping our doors locked especially on weeknights, when people didn't really drink or party. We would lock it when we remembered, but we wouldn't sweat it if we forgot. One weeknight, at about 3 a.m., I'm fast asleep, and so is my roommate. We hadn't locked the door. I'm usually a heavy sleeper, even through the loud noises of bright lights. Yet for some reason, I wake up. Nothing woke me up. No noise. No light, not even the almost naked person standing next to my bed, staring at me. I was too confused and exhausted to be scared or to even comprehend the situation. He was a male student, white, tall, fairly built, and only wearing underwear. I stared back at him. I can't remember if I told him to leave or if he left on his own. If I did, it was in a normal speaking voice, though now I would most likely scream at him. I watched him walk out and close the door behind him. My roommate slept through all of this. More confused than scared, I got up, locked the door, and immediately fell back asleep. The next morning I was convinced it was just a weird dream. Then I checked the door. It was still locked. We didn't lock the door last night. It was definitely real. My roommate didn't believe me until I told him about the lock. We checked our belongings. Nothing was stolen or even moved. I told the RA who was shocked that I didn't scream. And honestly, so was I. From the way the guy acted, we speculated that he was either drunk or high and went to the wrong room thinking it was his. Or he could have been sleepwalking. He didn't look like anyone on the floor or anyone I knew in the building, but the incident was so brief and late that my memory was foggy even the next day. Perhaps it's not shocking that something like this happened in a college dorm, but to us, it was significant and very freaky. Similar incidents happened with other people on our floor, but the people who trespassed on them were not tall white guys. Also, those incidents occurred on weekends. I still have no idea who it was or what was wrong with him, and I'm sure I'll never know. We locked our door every night from that moment on. My family and I went to this indoor golf course at a resort. It's raining like crazy, so we couldn't go to the outdoor one. 
This golf course is in the basement of the resort, and it was scary as hell down there. The course must have been at least 30 years old, and was damaged in places. No one else was down there except two workers. Now, we're playing miniature golf, having a good time, and this family walks in. It looked like two grandparents and their grandchildren. Well, time goes on, and we finish our game, and the old guy is just standing near the door to leave. My mom asks him if he can take a picture of all of us, and he said, sure. He takes maybe three pictures of us, and then starts taking them at different angles, and tells us to do different poses. Weird, yes, but it didn't weird us out too much at the time. He also complimented my hair. I have a nice afro. So I shook his hand and said thank you. He said some weird stuff to me, and then I said goodbye and thought that that was going to be it. No. I turn around to leave while everyone is going to turn their golf balls to the counter, and he starts talking to me, asking me to do some weird one of those tricks with him, while my family comes back and he starts talking to them. Now, I said it before, but this guy is a cuckoo. He starts asking just odd questions to them, while I'm dying laughing in the bathroom, because this guy is crazy. He hands my little sister a business card, and that I guess was the final straw. My dad booked it up the stairs, and everyone else followed behind. I didn't realize until my mom was saying goodbye to the guy. I booked it up the steps too, while laughing, and tears are streaming down my face. I got a hold of the card from my little sister and typed one of the websites online. I'm going to blur the number that was on it, but I'm sure you can find it on the website. It looks like that cult website on GTA 5, if you know what I'm talking about. I'm going to do some more research on the website, and you guys can too. DM me or comment anything that you guys find. I'm convinced this guy is hiding something, and I just want to figure it out. Thank you all for reading. I'm a 30-year-old female. Now, I know I said I had no more tale to tell. I honestly didn't expect to meet another creep. I'm not a good choice of targets, per se. I watch people. I watch my surroundings. I stay away from locations where I can't do that. I am visibly armed, but not when I'm in my own home. 9.45 on Sunday night, I was walking through my complex to retrieve my laundry when there was a bright flash of light. Not lightning, it's a clear night. Camera flash. So if someone is taking some family pictures, is that the case? There's no sound. No one on the streets. My scanning of the street is now definitely of an alarmed nature. Where the hell is the camera? And then I spot someone sitting on a dark porch, motionless. I can only see his outline but he's a large man. I watch him for a few seconds, but I can't even tell if he's awake, let alone taking photos. I look away and take a few more steps toward the laundry room. Flash. I spin and see the figure lowering a camera or a camera phone. I stop and stare, but he doesn't move a muscle. I take a few more steps now, turn, but he's still doing his best impression of a statue. I continue taking a few steps and turning to face him until I'm around the corner and into the laundry room. But aside from that camera, he doesn't move. So I hurriedly pack up my laundry and head back. As I turn the corner, I immediately spot him. He's still sitting in the darkness of the porch, but his hands are up with a camera poised at eye level. He's been waiting for me to come around the corner to get another shot so I stare him down from across the street. We stand like that for about 45 seconds. Flash. He slowly lowers the camera and returns to statue state. I stand glaring at him for some time, but he doesn't move again. Keeping my eyes on him, I pass by toward my home. He doesn't twitch the entire time he's in sight. Now, I don't engage my neighbors directly, even when I think they deserve it. 
If I have a problem, I have the office deal with it. So anyway, the next morning I was waiting at the door when it opened for the day. I drew out the events for them, but they seemed incredulous when I told them the apartment I'd been photographed from, so much so I had to take them out to point out the porch and assure them three times that I was positive which apartment I was talking about. Turns out the only person who lives there is a short, elderly woman. Now I cross my complex, armed. Hi everyone. I've been a lurker on Let's Not Me for a few years, but never thought I'd have a story creepy enough to share. Until now. I want to preface this story by saying that I'm pretty used to casual harassment and creepy incidents. I'm five foot, young, blonde, and female, and I'm from a suburb of Chicago. I've had my fair share of weird guys saying things to me and feeling like I'm in danger, but this has been haunting me for a while. I go to college at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and I walk to all of my classes since it's good exercise and the furthest one from my dorm is only 20 minutes away on foot. I take the same route to my 11 a.m. lecture every single Friday. About two weeks ago, I was walking to my class, and I had one earbud in. I was minding my own business and jamming, when I noticed a slightly beat-up white pickup truck driving alongside me. This by itself wasn't scary. There's a lot of construction happening on campus right now, and the truck itself had a generic symbol for a masonry company on the side. Maroon bricks with a tacky font that said masonry. Here's where it gets weird. The truck slowed down to match the speed I was walking at. I attributed this to him wanting to pull into the parking lot whose entrance was a few feet up. I stopped to let him pull in, but he stopped too. I looked to the side at the driver and it was obvious he was trying to make it look like he wasn't staring at me. He had a paper map unfolded in front of him, but I saw his eyes looking at me through the rearview mirror. He was an older guy, about 60, and white. I started walking again, passing the parking lot, and he began driving again, matching my pace like he did last time. I sped up a bit, and he sped up a bit as well. I could feel his eyes on me the entire time. This is where I started to internally freak out. It's broad daylight, there's people around, and a creepy man is definitely following me in his pickup truck. I began weighing my options. There's lots of people around, but if he tried something, I could probably take him out, since I've taken self-defense classes before. Or... I could go inside a building and risk missing my lecture to wait for him to go away. Thankfully, a bus pulled up behind me and honked repeatedly, annoyed that this car was going 5 miles an hour on a 30 road. The pickup truck drove away. I returned to my dorm room after class and started researching. I looked up every masonry company in the area, scrolling through websites and Yelp reviews for a couple hours and I didn't find a single one with a logo like the one on that side of the truck. I told my roommate what happened when she got back, and she thought I should report it to the campus police. I agreed with her and phoned it in. After being put on hold several times, they listened to my story and immediately rerouted me to the actual police department of the town. They sent an officer and his deputy to my room, and I recounted the story to them. The officer looked very concerned, and he agreed that I was followed. He asked if I knew the license plate, and I mentally kicked myself because I had been too freaked out to think to take a picture of it. I gave a description of the truck and driver, and offered to draw the logo from memory since I'm an art student. The officer said that they'd increase patrols in the area at the same time the next few days, and if they saw a car matching that description, they would pull him over. To the man in the white pickup truck, let's not meet again. Why I will never work in retail again. So I worked in the mall a couple of years ago, from age 18 to 20. 
I worked in a really well-known electronic shop in Canada. At the time of this story, I was the only girl working amongst a bunch of guys. Now, I'm a very small person, 5 foot 3, and I had shoulder-length bleach blonde hair, as well as I always wore fake eyelashes. Mainly, I'm explaining my looks because I was never treated well by customers. They assumed I was stupid and would either constantly walk past me and ignore me, or they would ask me something, think I'm wrong, and go to a male worker and ask the same thing, to only receive the same answer. I dealt with a lot of horrible customers, most of them being older men. I've had everything from sexist remarks to sexual remarks made to me, but I enjoyed the job and I needed the money. One day, I was with only one male co-worker and a woman, maybe the late 60s, came in. She seemed like a sweet old lady, so I sighed with relief that I would get to have a nice conversation with someone for once. But of course I was wrong. She came up to me and told me she had been overcharged on her phone bill. Now, while this isn't something we usually will deal with, I agreed to go look on her account to see what the charges were for. Unfortunately, the charges showed extra data usage or calling outside of Canada. I'm not too sure, but it basically showed that she got charged extra because of what she had done. So I moved my computer to show her and very politely told her what I saw and explained the extra charges. She kind of just looks at me and then clenched her fists and internally I was like, Oh crap, she's going to hit me. My co-worker was on break in the back. The mall was dead as it was almost closing time. So if she was going to hurt me, she could easily get away with it. So I started to back up and she slammed her fists on the desk so hard that the pens on the desk moved. Within two seconds after that, she started screaming at the top of her lungs, mostly incomprehensible, and she started walking around the store throwing things off the shelves. I kind of just stood there with a blank expression as I'd never experienced something like this before. She then came back to the counter, grabbed her phone and started to walk around the store slamming her phone on the ground, picking it up and repeat. She did it so much that there were shards of glass all over the floor for days afterwards. Finally, my co-worker came out and was like, WTF? and just looked at me as I was almost in tears. He came behind the counter and kind of covered me and told the lady she needed to get out. Obviously, she didn't like that and she just kept chucking her phone on the ground, screaming and swearing at us and just getting increasingly more agitated. My co-worker picked up the phone, called for security, and we just stood there in silence. Within like 10 minutes, the security guard showed up. Our security sucked as we barely ever had any incidents like this. He tried to calm her down and she was shoving him and started to throw things again. I was at this point across the store talking to another customer that came in and my co-worker yelled out to me, go in the back now. I looked at what he was looking at and she was running directly at me. I ran to the back and locked myself in the bathroom and I just bawled my eyes out for like two minutes. I came back out because I didn't hear any more screaming and I saw the security guard trying to put her in handcuffs. She literally body checked this poor man and ran. The police showed up and took our statements and looked at the security footage and they said they'd get back to us but we never heard anything again and pretty soon after that I quit. Before we get to the outro, here's an extra bonus story for making it this far into the video. A long time lurker here on our Let's Not Meet, first time posting. I guess this isn't exactly something that happened directly to me, but something odd I witnessed. This happened during the summer of 2017. Every weekday, I would wake up early, around 5am, for a morning workout, and then head to my job. Generally, I would leave my house around 5.30 because my morning drive took around 25 to 30 minutes, giving me enough time for two hours before I needed to leave before my shift started. 
Most of my drive was just me putting loud music on, trying not to fall asleep, and it being a freeway before 6am, almost everyone was going at least 10 miles over the speed limit. I drive most of the time on a main interstate before turning off onto a smaller highway, which I only would use for a mile or so. This highway was three lanes on each side. People also drive fast on here, but usually not more than 75 miles or more, and while you get some unsafe drivers in the morning, most people aren't swerving erratically. This highway runs north and south, an on-ramp from a main street becomes a lane. Then there are two entrances from the freeway I would take every day, one from the eastbound side and one from the westbound side. I hope that makes sense. But basically, I got on from the eastbound side, right as three cars from the westbound side are entering. One was sort of a orange sportyish car, and the other two were identical dark gray sedans. I don't remember exactly what make slash model they were, but I remember them being fairly uncommon models, not a sedan you'd see a hundred times a day. One was in front of this orange car, one behind. These guys were going at least 80 miles an hour. The orange car would change lanes, and the car in front would cut him off, while the one behind would change lanes to remain behind him. They kept this up the entire time I was on the highway near them, weaving in and out of the cars, not slowing down, before I pulled off at my exit. This could be a complete coincidence, and some a-hole drivers but I definitely got the vibe that the driver of the orange car was trying to get away from the gray cars. Maybe it was extreme road rage, or maybe something more sinister. Regardless, I'll never know. So drivers of those gray cars, let's not meet. Hello everyone, thank you for listening to the Creepy Fox Podcast. If this is the first time you've joined us, then make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it. That way you'll be notified of any and all future uploads coming here to the Creepy Fox. Also, if you enjoyed it, make sure to leave a like rating and a comment down below telling me what you all thought. And make sure to pick up some Creepy Fox merchandise if you'd like. That's available right below the video player. Now I'd like to go ahead and give a very special thank you to all our channel members. Thank you to Robbie, Bo, Spunky the Nutcase, Rice and Beans, Linz, Maribel, Medu Saltil, Dread Archive, Sean, Jen, Corey, and Sylvia. Thank you, of course, to all the regular viewers who constantly tune in and listen to the videos and share them with family and friends. It really does go a long way to help out the Creepy Fox family grow. Speaking of that... If you'd like to go ahead and share your own story for a future episode, then make sure to send it in using the user submissions email on screen. That's tcfnarrations at gmail.com. As you saw today, we did go ahead and feature some stories from Reddit. I have discussed this in the past, and because I want to go ahead and give you guys more videos without you having to wait forever for new uploads, I'll be going ahead and including stories from Reddit, along with the scary stories that subscribers send. Thank you for understanding. So, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Until then, take care, and have yourself an amazing day.